friends, welcome to the Three Appointment Digital Denture Webinar. It is being presented by Jimmy Stegall, National Procedural Solutions Specialist for Densply Serona. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Jimmy Stegall. He is a seasoned dental lab operations and management executive with more than 40 years of teaching and clinical experience in the US and Canada. He is a published author and has assisted in research projects with dentists, universities, and manufacturers. After a successful 30 plus career helping to build and lead a large dental lab in South Carolina, Jimmy served as a division president of a large dental lab network. And he is now a national procedural solution specialist for Densply Serona. As a key opinion leader, teacher, and trainer, Jimmy has demonstrated a history of bringing results-oriented strategies and techniques to dental practices and labs throughout the United States. And it is now my pleasure to say, take it away, Jimmy. Thank you, Jessica. Good to see you again. And uh, thanks for having me, guys. Um, I am still excited. Uh, I've, I've been with Dent Supply now five years, and I've been talking about these digital dentures for four of those years, and I'm still just as excited as I was day one, guys. When I come, you come from a 40-year background in the lab, and uh, a lot of my years were spent chairside helping folks like you with uh, denture try-ins, denture bites, uh, custom tray impressions, uh, implant cases, shades, all that. And I was fortunate enough to have uh, also spent some time with the students at a couple of dental schools on a regular basis. And having heard and watched, you know, both communities, communities of students, communities of residents, and uh, of course, practicing dentists, uh, I've seen a lot of dentures and I've seen the struggles that we've had. So when I saw what the digital denture workflow was gonna do for us, I really got excited and still do to this day. So hopefully um, you'll take something away here that you can uh, jump into tomorrow, but it, it's really catching hold, It, it uh, the trend, uh, of the digital denture workflows has just skyrocketed and, and that's why I think leads the way with uh, their, their materials uh, which uh, are far superior than some of the others but it's good to have some of the others as well so you have some choices I was always the guy that's uh, about choices but when uh, when I talk about dentures uh, and try to help folks with dentures you know I've come to start asking a common question and that is you know what do you like most about doing dentures? And it's comical that uh, the number one answer is nothing. And uh, I understand it uh, because uh, hundreds and hundreds of appointments chairside, uh, I see the struggle with this bite rim. I understand how difficult and challenging it is and how little patients enjoy that process. And the number of appointments is what patients always ask me, you know, why does it take so long to get a, a set of dentures made? And and yeah, I get it, it does. And it's a very um, tough process to complete and one that's not a favorite. Hopefully by the end of tonight, you will be uh, thinking that, hey, maybe I want to try this again. You know, because it, it, we'll talk about the numbers, but everybody knows we were taught that, you know, to do a denture, it should take five appointments, but it, it always takes more. And then there's always appointments after delivery, you know, where another four or five. So it, it can literally be eight, 10, 12 total appointments uh, to even get finished. And folks just don't like that. So it's no fun. And then heaven forbid, if they lose it, right, we've got to start all over. So let, let's talk about ways that, you know, we can move from that. Now, um, again, coming from the lab space and coming from a lab who was doing, you know, 100 dentures a day, you know, I had a lot of experience in this process and I got to measure and watch and do, you know, how things are done. And if you go in most labs today, this is what you see, right? This is uh, pretty common still. Uh, even though there's fewer of us, right? When I started in the lab space, there were 17,000 dental labs. Today, there are less than six. And so that makes it difficult to find folks that can do these things. Uh, teaching somebody how to set teeth and, and wax uh, denture base and you know, even the vesting processing, it, it takes a good set of hands. But when I show you know, this video to lay folks, they say, really, that's how I got on my teeth? <laughs> yeah, it is. And uh, I know it's, uh, it looks antiquated, but you know, we've gotten pretty good at it. Unfortunately, the inherent qualities of this process uh, has left us with dentures that don't fit like they should. Ideally, we get um, you know, a denture fit that's under 100 micron space for a perfect layer of saliva, but we very, very rarely get that with acrylic processed dentures, uh, whether it's press-packed or inject-packed. 
Um, we, we've known this forever and you know, patients know it. Um, if uh, you wanna Google and see what the uh, total annual spend in this country is on denture adhesive, um, it, it's $4 billion. So we, we know they don't stay in as good as uh, we'd like them to. And that, this, this process is, is a culprit of that. Now, if you go in some of the newer uh, oriented labs that are focused on the digital workflow, you'll see things like this. You'll see them scanning your records, right? They'll take your traditional impressions and bytes and they'll put them in a scanner and they will digitize your records. So they are moving you into the digital workflow, whether you know it or not. Then they have this cool software that allows them to create those dentures on the screen, you know, with the same knowledge and skills they've always had with just a different set of tools. And once the dentures are created, then they go to an output device. Um, we've had the software for quite a while, um, but we are just now getting into the time where we've got the output devices that will give us the accuracy we need and the materials. That was a, a big challenge is developing the materials that we you know, wanted or needed that uh, would give us the aesthetics and the strength and all the things uh, that we had to have to do a good denture. But we have that now. We have uh, unbelievably strong denture bases. We have uh, teeth that we can still use out of a card. We have teeth that we can mill out of a pack of PMMA. And then we have teeth that we can print. And that gives us plenty of options to do any kind of denture case that you have. Now this dent supply system, the Loose Stone Digital Print System, is a fully validated, FDA validated system from start to finish. Every component, every process, every piece of equipment has gone through that process. And we're the only system on the market that has that. So you can have that confidence and comfort to know that you know, everything's been tested and it does what it says it will do. And uh, it is a fully feature, a very um, complete system, all the shades, all those things that you, you, know, you need to have to be able to do all the cases that you have. So we're moving from analog to digital, you know, not only because technicians are harder to find and create, but also because we want to get better, right? Acrylic has been good for a long time, but there are newer materials that can really help us be better. So if that's what labs look like, you know, what does the dental office look like? And in, as you know, we were all taught in school that a denture should take five appointments and they're listed here. Uh, I can assure you that in South Carolina, visit four at, at my place typically became visit 4A and 4B and sometimes 4C until we got the patient happy. And then to start all that off, you know, I would go in and help with these custom tray impressions and these uh, bite rim appointments. And even with me in the room, it's a challenge. It is a hard, hard thing to do in our world is to take a good denture bite when, when, when you're just using, you know, big, pieces of wax. And of course, border molding and custom trays, we've had it, we know it, but it doesn't make it any easier. It is hard. If we can move some of that into the digital workflow or change the way we do that a little bit, our world gets a whole lot better. So when we talk about dentures and, you know, a question I get quite often from dentists is, what do I have to buy? What do I have to learn to do a digital denture? Well, first off, you don't have to change anything. If you are happy with your impression technique, if you are happy with your bite technique and you're getting good results, you can keep doing that, right? And as I said, you send those records to the laboratory that's digitally oriented and they will digitize those records for you. And from that point forward, it is a digital denture workflow and you gain all the advantages of that. But, you know, with intraoral scanners, everybody wants to know, right? Can I scan soft tissue? Well, the short answer is yes, right? If I look at these scans, I absolutely could build a denture on these scans. These scans are perfect. They look great. We have all the data that we need. What I'm not saying in that statement is that uh, the scan that you see is the absolute positively most difficult, challenging, to, uh, challenging scan to accomplish intraorally. So much so that nobody is really teaching that you scan soft tissue on an edentulous patient. Now, there's some manufacturers and some speakers and some uh, research folks uh, that are saying it and are teaching it. And, and I'm not saying you can't do it or shouldn't do it, but I'm going to tell you that it's a learning curve. I've seen a lot of docs try to do it and it is hard to do. It really is so much so that we try to find another way until the technology catches up and makes it easier for us like it did with hard tissue, but clearly it can be done, but it, it's a challenge. Now, 
before that, the intraoral scanners were a challenge up until maybe three or four years ago of an accuracy issue, right? We could get really good scans in a quadrant, but when we moved around the arch, we started losing some accuracy and the cross arch accuracy needs to be spot on for a denture. But with the newer devices, we have now learned that we can get that accuracy cross arch. Uh, any of the newer uh, main names that you hear and see are certainly accurate enough to do it, but they haven't made them easy for us to use yet. So none of the universities that, that I've worked with, none of the speakers, none of the KOLs um, are really saying to you, you, get this scanner and start scanning the soft tissue for your dentures. I'm not saying you can't do it, but there's a huge learning curve and a lot, a lot of practice. If you want to go down that path, though, this is the guy to go look. You can uh, Google Dr. LaRusso. He's a dentist. Um, in Italy uh, at a dental school, and he's done probably most of the leading groundbreaking research on scanning edentulous soft tissue, and he's an amazing uh, scanning technician. He really is. Watching him scan a, a soft tissue ridge is amazing, but I know that uh, the average guy with the scanner just can't match that. And, you know, Dr. Russo does it all day, but read his stuff, you know, and, you know, learn from him and find a willing patient and have at it. We're gonna focus on another direction though, because we know that doing a digital denture is good. We know that we have the strength we need, the aesthetics we need, but the big win for you and your patients is the fit. There is no argument from anybody that a digital denture doesn't fit better than a traditional acrylic denture. Right. When we do a denture digitally, we're using computer technology and saying to that computer, hey, I've got a part A, the ridge. I want to make a part B fit it really well, the denture. And the computer will do exactly what it's programmed to do. So if we wanted to get a one-to-one -one fit, we could. Um, obviously, we don't want it that tight. But when you look at acrylic dentures and you think about the space typically between a regular acrylic denture and the tissue is 100, 125, 150 microns um, at, when it's good, um, and these are well under 100 micron fits, then you start to understand why patients are saying in every clinical appointment that I've been in four years that I've never felt a denture fit this way. And it's just an intimacy of fit uh, to tissue because the computer helped us get there. So that's your biggest win, you know, and that brings you all the advantages associated with that, right? Patients not complaining as much about them staying in. Patients not coming back as often for uh, post-delivery adjustments. The second big win for you is that if they do have a problem, you have the record on file or the lab has the record on file. So all we have to do is pull the case back up again and reprint it again for you. So we can do that without impressions. Now, if it's down the road and we need a new intaglio surface, then we take a wash in the old denture and we match it up to the original file and we can duplicate a denture 100%. So you're gonna cut your time tremendously. We are routinely seeing three appointment, four appointment dentures. And in some cases, we see quite a few uh, two appointment dentures because of all these benefits. So, you know, when we look at fit, now watch this plan. So this is a printed trial, right? This was designed this from a, and this guy cannot get that, right? This was designed from a reference denture in front of We're gonna talk about that. And it has the, the adhesion, cohesion that we really want. Suction is a term that came into being because uh, we needed help. Dentures are not supposed to stay in by suction. Dentures are supposed to stay in by adhesion, cohesion, by right? drop of water, two pieces of glass. And in order to do that, though, it has to have a pretty perfect amount of space between the denture and the tissue. And traditional denture processing just doesn't do that routinely. A CAD CAM denture, absolutely, as you saw there. So this is a very common thing with digital dentures on how well they fit. So I mentioned reference dentures, and this is where this study really shines. This is kind of the study that uh, said, okay, intraoral scanners can be a good thing. If you look at the three scans, now there are plenty of uh, tests out there about how good digital dentures fit and different types of digital dentures, but I want us to focus on one thing here. You know, the denture uh, on the left or the, the scan on the left, it, blue and, and red or yellow are all more space than we want, right? If, um, if it's green, it's good. So the one on the far left is a regular traditional process denture with a regular traditional impression. The one on the far right is actually a, a scan of a ridge of, of the denture fit when it was scanned of the soft tissue. So like Dr. LaRusso was able to scan the soft tissue, the denture was made and printed or milled and then still 
much better, but still some space in the palate. We, we wish it was uh, a little more intimate. Then one in the middle is a denture built from a scan using an intraoral scanner of an impression. And so that kind of woke everybody up and said, hey, we can use scanners and do this really well. And so that's kind of where we're focused on when we talk about clinical steps in a digital denture, and that's using uh, a scanner. And we're going to get into that. Now, digital dentures um, uh, can be made two ways, right? Uh, it's just a CAD CAM process, right? The top picture being CAD, computer aided design, we're creating a denture in the virtual world. And the bottom picture, CAM, I've got to have a physical denture when I'm done, right? So that is the computer aided manufacturing. So that can be a mill or a printer. Um, and we started in our world with mills. We, we were using mills routinely, had been for years milling crowns. And so we had great mills and great milling strategy, but until somebody made us a pink disc, we couldn't build dentures. We had software before we could actually make things. Well, um, companies came out with uh, pucks and these are acrylic. This is, this, this is Lucitone 199. So it's the same acrylic that we've always used. So with the same physical properties of acrylic, except that that puck is fully cured. Right. There's no more curing. So there's no more shrinking, there's no more monomer release. And that's going to result in a little bit stronger than a traditionally processed acrylic. But you put it in a, a five axis mill and mill out your denture file. It's a very, very accurate process. So a mill denture fits just as good as a printed denture. But that is a long process. Right. Um, one puck can take four and a half hours. So for somebody who's got to do 100 a day, that made very little sense to me that I just, you know, we can't afford that many milling machines and it's just too long of a process. And, and so it's good and it kind of became our premier top denture because of the digital technology, but it was way slow, which made it more expensive. That made it expensive because of time, but also the cost, right? So milling is what we call reductive technology, meaning we start with something and we cut it down to something else and everything in between those two points is just waste or powder. So it's an, I gotta buy this to get that. And it just became an expensive process. I think everybody knew and agreed that we would be printing dentures one day. And thank goodness for these guys that uh, brought to market what I call our generation one resins. Um, this is, was about maybe seven, six, seven years ago. And at that time uh, in the lab world, we were using 3D printers routinely for printing wax to cast copings or partials, uh, printing uh, some resins, but we didn't have a pink until a couple of companies came on the market with a, a digital denture resin. So we had the pink and we had a tooth colored and a, just a couple of shades of each. We could print the base, print the teeth from the same file that we used to mill the dentures with, but we could do it faster, cheaper, um, and it, well, okay, it's great now we can go. But then when we finished it and looked at it, we thought, wait a minute, it doesn't look like the acrylic dentures we've been doing. And, you know, anytime you add something new to your processes, you want it to be as good as what you're already doing. And in this case, it wasn't, it, it wasn't as uh, aesthetic and it was a near as strong as acrylic. These were very brittle and, and fragile, um, but they were very cost effective and we could do them very quickly. And this, these generation one resins are still around and they make great resins for like temporaries or provisionals, but for something permanent, you, you really want a resin, a base resin, a tooth resin that's as good or better than the acrylic we've been using. And that's where generation two resins came in and the Loose Tone Digital Print was the first one to market. There are a couple more out there now. And these are polymer resins. These are not modifications of acrylic. They're, they're whole new chemistry here, but polymer resins, you know, built and engineered to work with these really sophisticated printers today and create a result that, you know, we all can look at and say, that looks as good or better than any denture I've ever done. And that's exactly where we are today with these generation two resins. And again, multiple printer options today, multiple uh, resin options, but the loose tone leads the way. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons is it's the only one that's fully validated start to finish. It's the only one that has every component that you need to build it. And it's all one system. So it's a, it's a totally modular, you know, plug and play type system for the lab to do. And it has all the options and the aesthetics that we're getting out of the latest materials are absolutely amazing. I could never in my life make a denture with my hand with wax and carded teeth 
and, and press packing look like this or shape like this or, or finish like this. And I can do these much faster. So we're in a great space now, but I'll give you a little overview of what this system looks like in the lab. So if you go into a lab and you see somebody doing digital ventures, it starts with a design. Right, so the models are brought into the computer and then we bring the mold of teeth we want, molds that we all know, and then we start positioning. So we're setting teeth virtually, but the computer gives us a lot of tools we never had with our fingers, of course. I can move them multiple at a time or one at a time. I can, you know, have a lot of tools to measure how close my contacts are and, you know, I can mold and morph and shape my denture teeth. So, you know, if there's a mold that we think is the right for the patient, but it needs to be stretched a little bit or shrunk a little bit we have that capability you know and then you know once we get it all in place and i just go back and check my occlusion and you know take out all the high spots make sure all the contacts are tight and what i end up with is uh, a file uh, for the base and files for the teeth right or you know if i'm using carded teeth you have all those options so the denture is designed and it's basically you know a group of stls the teeth you know having the options in the teeth is is good because you know it gives you the choice right so let's talk about the base first the lucid home digital print base again polymer resin um super high strength right when you when you make a denture base for a living you know you want to have the words high impact on your box and high impact means it's been tested and it won't break before um 900 joules per meter square every acrylic we've always used um typically a thousand to twelve hundred uh, this material tested 1500 uh, joules per meter squared before it broke and that's good that's better than what the acrylic was but when you go to the fda you have to test it at mouth temperature as well so when and boston university did all of dense supplies validations uh, when boston you know heated it up to 98 degrees it went to 3000 joules per meter squared it literally doubled in strength and that means that this denture base is two to three times stronger than any acrylic we've ever seen and that's exciting right and you want to have studies but in the south rednecks we're going to test things our own way so we take them out in the parking lot we run over with our trucks and uh, as expected acrylic dentures are going to shatter under a, a truck tire but the loose tone digital print i see people throwing them off buildings throwing them against the wall tossing them in sinks great never did i ever have a patient or a dentist call me and say hey um uh, we ran over it i need another one most of them called and said you know patient dropped their denture in the sink. So, you know, tossing this thing in sinks and watching what happens is pretty fun. Now, you know, anything's breaking, that's right. I'm a red, be a minute, I'll break it. But I haven't seen many break at all, not many. And the good news here as well, I've never seen a tooth come out. The chemistry that's used to bond the teeth to the bases after they're printed, uh, amazing technology. I literally take pliers all the time and try to break a tooth out of a pocket. I cannot. I break teeth every time. So four years now, I've seen some break, tried to make them break. I cannot get a tooth out. So no more patients coming back and say the tooth popped out. You know, of course, sometimes we send them home with the dog, get some, and, you know, we want to make sure that it can withstand that. So I've been giving them to Max for a couple of years, and uh, Max probably doesn't qualify as a real dog, but he's not able to damage them either. But if we go back to Boston and watch this denture uh, in, the, uh, in the Instron machine, right? Sorry. Um, any acrylic denture is going to break in the first couple of millimeters. Acrylic's a brittle product, but these polymer resins are a uh, a different beast, and and they're just amazingly strong. So you're going to have that confidence using a generation two resin that you're going to have a super super strong denture. Um, as far as uh, the other attributes of the product, you know, every other 3D resin out there has to be shaken or stirred or put on a roller or in a heater. You know, our guys figured out a way to really uh, mix all the colors together in, in a stable enough uh, foundation that you don't have to do that. So it's just literally open the bottle and pour it in the printer. Um, when you cut on this stuff, it's going to feel like a composite. So it powders instead of peels. So it's a joy to finish. It finishes very, very quick. And remember, again, if we're creating our denture in our computer, that means all my festooning, all my anatomy, all my shape is done in that world, in that space. So when I print it, there's really nothing to finish. It's more of a polish. So in traditional dental lab workflows, uh, to finish a denture, 35, 45 minutes. Um, here, five minutes, 10 minutes, because it really is just a quick polish. And we have all the shades that you know, you're used to. So getting back to teeth, right? So we have different teeth options, right? A carded tooth, right? 
everybody knows the dead supply portrait tooth right? it's been around forever it's a great tooth lifetime warranty all that well all they did was take the portrait tooth and modify the shape of it a little bit and give it a new name this is portrait uh, that's already carved out on the back which means we can put it in more tighter spaces and that they called it IPN 3D, but it is just a portrait too. So for those of you that like portrait and want to continue to see the aesthetics and known factor of using a portrait tooth, then just ask your lab to use that. Just know that if you don't have about uh, 14 millimeters of space between the ridges in the bicuspid molar area, they won't be able to get these teeth in there. That's the beauty of the next uh, option would be uh, using an open denture tooth library, which means I can then morph or shape that library. If I'm using a carded tooth library, I don't have the ability in the computer to change that tooth shape, or otherwise the card does me no good. But with a, a library that I'm going to mill or print, I have full control. And if I have a tight bite, then I could just make it flatter on the back in the computer so it mills out that way. So this was our first step into that world, and that was using our multi-layer PMMA which we had had on the shelf. We had, it, uh, labs were using it for uh, temporaries. It is uh, six or eight layers. It looks really, really good. It's got a real good durability to it. Um, and we just had to send it back to the FDA and say, hey, we'd like to validate it for a denture tooth as well. And it, it did really well in those studies. So this was where I thought we would end because we had all the shades and everything was, was good. And my naive doubt that we couldn't or our engineers couldn't figure out a way to take a printed resin and make it look good. Well, they have really show, shown me up because um, we took our Lucian Digital Value product, which is what we were using to print the monolithic uh, tri dentures. You'll see those more in a minute and had it uh, validated as a denture tooth as well. And it tested really well. We're excited about that. But to make a monolithic resin look good, you have to have a really special library. So our team uh, took a, a couple of uh, teeth that we had, the Genios and the Portrait, well-known uh, carded teeth forever. They digitized them and then they anatomized them. They gave them a lot more contour and shape, which will help the light uh, reflection, refraction. And the very first entry I did with this Lucestone Digital Value with one of those new digital libraries, I was just blown away that a monolithic resin could look that good. Well, the limitations to that is that it is not as durable as a PMMA or a carded tooth, and we only had it in six shades. So, you know, we knew we needed to be better, and our guys did get much better. So, uh, October a year ago, they introduced Loose Tone Digital IPN. This, this formally rolled out fully on the market this July, and all 16 beta shades plus a couple of bleach shades. And this is uh, the most durable tooth resin on the market by far. Um, there's no contest with, with anything yet available. This material has the durability of a portrait tooth. Um, manufacturers test the durability of the tooth themselves, right? There is no formal government test for that. So anytime you see a tooth wear uh, ad or advertisement or chart, you know that the manufacturer did it. And Dentsply has done it like that forever. We've always tested our teeth the same way, right? The, the carded teeth that we've made for over 80 years they've been tested just like we tested this so the same test for both these teeth and you can see that the numbers are almost identical to our portrait which is you know kind of mind-blowing for a monolithic resin that we're going to 3d print the tooth out of that we design and create so we have the strength and we have the aesthetics because of these really cool libraries that make them look really good when you see them on the screen you think how is that going to look good but as you can see we've got translucency we've got mammalons um, it's actually pretty amazing that a monolithic can uh, look this good and be that strong. So we have, a, uh, you know, various options in the, in the molds and in the libraries that we use. Uh, so again, there, there's not going to be a, a denture case that you're going to run across it. You know, this system can't satisfy. So, you know, that's kind of the system that, you know, labs like NDX are using for you when you do it. But, you know, let's, you know, how do we do it, right? How do we? How do we go about this? So to make a denture, right, it's pretty simple, and, and whether it's digital or otherwise, but in digital dentures, we, we got to generate records like we do with analog dentures, but we are going to digitize those records. That's where we step our part, right? We, we don't start, we quit worrying about wax and stone and we, we start looking at files. So once we digitize the records and not the records, I mean the upper and lower arch and the byte registration can all be digitized. So we, we have everything in the computer as it is in, in the mouth. And then we use a really cool piece of software to create the dentures and then we send it to an output device. 
and we have a really good output device. So, you know, options are as many as we've all learned, but I'm, I'm going to, you know, hit on a couple more that maybe, you know, we haven't thought about. I wish I had thought about them uh, earlier with even with analog workflows. And primarily I'm talking about the reference denture because, you know, now I realize there's really good data in a reference denture that we can use to go to the next step that will eliminate a lot of the headaches that you and I feel in the denture appointments. So anytime we start talking about dentures, I, I, I like to, anytime I get a chance to talk to Dennis about, you know, how to communicate to labs, I, I talk about the tools that I used in my history that really made things easier for me. And I think the more data you give to a lab, the better. You know, we all know that, you know, we can, you know, put the bite rims in, uh, melt them, shape them, carve them and get them right and make marks on them for size of edge, midline, cuspid position. But you want to make some of that easier, right? Uh, the alometer and papillometer are really inexpensive tools to have on hand. Alometer is going to give us our cuspid to cuspid width, so it'll help us pick what anterior tooth to use. I always carried that one and I always carried the papillometer. Papillometer, a little shelf on the back, and, and you rest it on the inside of the papilla and have the patient do a relaxed lift and a high smile. And I take those two numbers and I can convert that into where the anterior, the two centrals go vertically. So it gives me my incisal edge position really, really easy. So, you know, and that's kind of all I really need as far as tooth position, tooth size, but VDO was always a challenge. And of course the bite rim was, you know, the number one thing we used, but this thing was not around when I was assisting chair side so many times. I wished it had been because this is the absolute best um, VDO device I've ever seen. Uh, the Con Meteor just goes hand in hand with the reference denture um, because it, this is based on uh, the biologic measurement between the center of our eye to the corner of our mouth. And that measurement translates to our VDO. So if you have the Con Meteor and you have a set of these uh, flexible clearance gauges, and that's all they are, I, I got these at Amazon. They're half millimeter thick, each of them. And the way this thing works is you set uh, the tool to that biologic measurement, tighten it down, and then flip it around so that the uh, other side markers are now under the nose and under the chin. And you know, because the uh, other side you marked is the patient's actual biologic measurement, then that's your VDO, which means if that's right up under the nose and the curve bar is touching the chin, then she is in her proper VDO. If her chin does not touch the curve bar, then that tells us that that patient is overclosed and we want to open them. And we use the flexible clearance gauges and we just start stacking them up and have the patient a bite down on the anterior on them until we get the chin touching the bar. And now we've recorded the video, we just have them hold on to those flexible gauges for a second and squirt bite registration material between the posteriors and boom, we've recorded the video. I'll show you this video how this works it make make it a little bit more clear but um uh, this is not a display product this is not a jimmy product i don't get anything for this but i talk about it almost every time i talk to a group um, because i think it's probably one of the best things ever made you know to have chair side so again so we tighten the net nut down now we uh, put the marker under the nose her bar touches the chin so that is her video she's good but if she's overclosed, like old dentures may be, then we'll see a slight space under there. And then we just start adding the reference gauges until we get open enough to be touching the curve bar. Boom, that's the right video. Then we just record that bite. This device can also be inverted and do it for, if you have somebody that's over open, you can say, how much are they open? How much are they open? So check the guys out, Con Meteor, just a really cool uh, uh, video gauge. Another tool that I always like to use was the UTS CAD. Um, UTS CAD is not a face bow, it is a um, occlusal plane tool, right? Uh, this is an Ivoclar product that uh, really eliminates, uh, wax, I've used this in analog work uh, because it eliminated wax try-ins that are candid. You, know, you hear that a lot, a wax try-in goes in and say, it looks candid, sloping downhill. Well, this will virtually eliminate that if you use it right. And it, it just goes uh, with the, the thing we always know, right? Uh, to the inner pupil plane, right? It matches that. So this U-shaped thing around the head pivots, right? Pivots, you know, in the same plane as the eye. So you match it up to the inner pupil line. And then it pivots also, you know, from the ear to the chin so we can get camper's plane locked in. So, you know, we use this, lock it in, and there's two numbers on that scale, right? And those two numbers can actually be plugged into the lab's design software. And that literally sets the occlusal plane for the dentures. And so it's it's an easy thing to do, and it's it's that's almost foolproof. 
The other feature to this device is that thing called centric tray. It looks like a little triple tray that will mount to the uh, bite fork. And you can actually record your uh, video with that as well as using the con meteor. And you would keep your UTS CAD in your office and you would just send the centric tray to the lab. They would scan that, match it in with their, um, add it into their scan of your case with your models and enter this data from the UTS CAD in their occlusal plane be set and they can move forward with setting the teeth. So that QR code will take you to um, the uh, instructions for use for the UTS CAD. Uh, so many folks call me and ask me about it. I thought I'd put that in there. All right. Um, what's different? Well, if you go in a lab right today, you're going to see a digitally oriented lab. You're going to see less and less of this. So less and less of the, the, the boiling water, the curing tanks, you know, the smell of monomer and more and more of this, right? Computers, designs, uh, dentures on a screen, dentures in a printer. And you know, it's, it's the only way dent, uh, labs are gonna be able to keep up with the unbelievable growth that's coming. If you guys don't know it, our population is getting to the point over the next 12 years that denture business is as busy it is now, it's gonna be even more busier. You know, we're actually even worried that there's not enough dentists to see the patients. And that's just based on ADA data of about dental school graduates. Um, Oh, about 10 years ago, we were graduating in this country, um, 2.3 dentists per 100,000 of the population. And today, even with more dental schools and larger class sizes, we're only graduating about 1.8 uh, per 100,000. So I, I think it's going to be a challenge for a denture patient to get an appointment. And, you know, in all, and the only way labs going to keep up with it with fewer people or fewer labs is to go digital. So that's what we'll see, right? And when you go in a lab, you'll see people doing different things like assembling dentures instead of setting teeth. Right. So, you know, you could take uh, like this lady, this young girl had been at the lab of six months and she had done some scanning of models and things like that. But in one day, you know, I had her trained to you know, run the printers, you know, get the dentures out, get everything cleaned and assemble the teeth. You know, just you know, I had to show her what what teeth was what, which way they went in. And you know, by the end of the day, she was very, very good at it. And I imagine, you know, a week or two later, she was a very productive addition to that denture team. If I had to put a regular analog tooth setter on the bench and teach him from scratch, it's going to be months before I get them knowledgeable and a couple of three years before they're actually productive and are actually creating a benefit for the production. So this really allows the labs to scale up. So, you know, what she was assembling was carded teeth. Now that we're printing teeth in segments, it's even faster, right? So um, it takes, uh, it took her maybe 12 to 15 minutes to assemble one denture with carded teeth. Um, we can do these printed dentures and segments in five to seven. Again, just gives us the capacity to scale and meet the demand that you're going to have, that you will have uh, of us to get them done. So that's what's different, right? And you won't see the old handout curing units. You see these uh, modular uh, digitally oriented curing boxes that instead of an eight hour overnight cook of dentures, these are 30 minutes and they're ready to go. All I have to do is polish them a little bit. So that's what you're going to see different in the lab. Now your world, right? This is where it's going to divert from what you're used to. And so it takes a little bit of um, effort, right? We all get in, you know, a routine and what we, what we know and what's comfortable. And, um, and so I, I thought back during these last four years in the development of this, you know, of all the appointments I've been in and, and trying to remember patient's reaction to wax try-ins. And uh, honestly, a lot of the times, right, we would do what I'm sure most of you do, and that is, all right, um, we've got your denture set up here. It's in wax, and we're going to put it in your mouth, but it's wax, so we don't want you to bite on it, right? And uh, But we're just going to put it in, take a look at it. We're going to give you a mirror. We're going to ask you what you like and what you don't like. We want you to be happy, so we want to uh, you know, meet your needs. And quite often, patients would look like this, right? They would have this, you know, I don't know, and they would even say to us, I, I don't know, isn't that your job or isn't that why I'm here with you? And, you know, we would say, yes, thank you very much. We will do what we were trained to do. And we'll put those teeth where um, we think they need to be based on your biologic measurements. And what's really happened to all these years of doing that, guys, is that, um, that your patients aren't happy. I, if you don't know it, right, <laughs> that's one of the reasons we don't like doing it, right, because they really are not happy. The ADA does a, a survey every year of denture patients and every year it's 50 to 60 percent of denture patients say they have a significant problem with their teeth, with their dentures. You know, that's just not good odds. And, and most every denture patient you've had 
has told you about something they didn't like about their denture and that there's a denture in the drawer somewhere. And, and the trying appointment is a real confusing thing to them because where we, we want them to talk about buccal cord or an incisal edge and midlines and occlusion, uh, all they're thinking or primarily thinking is, I hope my dentures don't taste like this or feel like this, and I'm scared to bite and you know those things that we warned them about. So these, it's, it's time for a change, I think, of trying data, trying appointments. And um, I, this is genius what I'm about to share with you. And you know, in the past, I've done it exactly like I described. You know, tell me what you like, tell me what you don't like, tell me what you want me to move. I want you to be happy, right? And, and it's hard for patients to answer that question. Uh, Dr. Valerie McMillan Cooper came up with this and uh, you know, she, she's a young girl, but she was known as a denture queen in school because she really loves doing dentures and still does board certified prosthodontist. And, but and she, she came up with this and I think this is genius. And if I never did a digital denture, I just did analog, I would still do this, right? On the trying appointments. But you know, I think the, the printed dentures uh, try-ins are better, but these are the things you need to start asking your denture patients. And it's just categories, right? And it, 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 is the teeth, are the teeth too light or too dark? Um, are the teeth that need to move them left or right, up or down? Um, are the teeth too big or too small? When you ask two, two pointed questions, right? They, they only have two choices and they can answer that. That's gonna give you so much more better data at your trying appointment, right? Now, the one thing you can't ask with a wax try-in is a feel good because it definitely doesn't feel good to them. And so that's where the printed try-in really shines. So there, I'm not saying we, we're going to run these out of town, right? I think there's always going to be a need for these in some cases. You know, a dentist, a prosthodontist that really likes moving teeth, you know, and really wants to have that, you know, hands-on uh, deal. You, you will still get a wax try-in or a Wagner try-in, which is a combination. But uh, and then there's some patients that absolutely will not be able to tolerate not seeing what their actual teeth are going to look like. I think it's time to have a different conversation for better data. And that's where the printed try-in really shines. When we do a printed try-in, it is a monolithic printed denture. And ours, this try-in material is the same as the pink. So 3,000 joules meter squared is super strong. So they can wear it for however long they want to wear it. I've actually had dentists tell me that they've delivered these and the patient still hadn't come back. Um, but the question's always going to become, what does it look like? But I try to lead folks, coach folks into, let's don't lead with that, right? Let's, let's lead with what we have here. And especially patients that have had wax triangles before, you know, if you bring up that experience and say, hey, how would you like to have a test drive denture that you can take home? You can let your spouse see, you can eat meals with it, you know, and take it for a test drive, figure out what you like and don't like, and then come back and we'll have that conversation. So it is a truly functional test drive, you know, let's, let's see how this works denture. Now, in our material, at least we have six shades, we can polish them up and we can paint pink on them, but I think this is a much better way to get data because when they come back, they're gonna be able to give you that information, right? Uh, they're too big, um, it doesn't feel good, whatever. And you can make those adjustments. It's easy for you to make those adjustments, right? Oh, it's high over here, I hit high. Well, you know what to do, right? You get in there with your paper and you tap, tap, grind. Uh, it hurts on the inside. When you get in there and grind that spot down, take another impression. These things change the game with the, the uh, try and appointment. And, and I believe it's really uh, the best way to do it these days. And it's kind of the heart of the three appointment denture. Whereas we start with uh, impressions and bite, but notice that the impressions and bite that we start with are from the patient's existing dentures. That is the reference denture, right? And from that data, we create the denture design and we print it out monolithically so the patient can wear it for a bit. And then from the changes made after that, we can go straight to final. So. This is an awesome tool, guys, um, and, and labs can paint pink on it, right? If it's going to be a long-term thing, get the lab to paint pink gingiva on it, make it look a little prettier. Um, but I will say this, that some labs are having such good success with these uh, printed try-ins that dentists are saying, man, it was so close. I, I just adjusted a spot or two on a molar. I wished it had been the final. Some labs have heard that enough to say, okay, you know what? I am going to print the final for the try-in. I'm going to print and assemble the final denture. I'm going to send you that. And we're going to call it a try-in, but if it goes, it is also your final denture. And I think it's a great idea. It's going to cost a little more probably, but you know, it also can eliminate a whole nother appointment and get down to two pretty quickly. So let's talk about this reference denture, right? This reference denture gives us a starting point that we, we've, we've had, but we've never had it this good, right? So 
patient comes in and demographics tell us that 60 to 80 percent of denture patients in the chair actually do have a denture or dentures and we want to use those we want to use that data to get us started why go back and recreate new data with the wax rim let's use these right to give us an idea of a occlusal plane tooth position and of course you know get you an impression in there i know that everybody on this webinar can take a good wash and a denture, right? Reline impressions have been easy. We, we do that so often, you've gotten really good at it. So let's use that skill, let's use that ease of practice to, to make our first impressions. So think of the patient's existing dentures as your preliminary impression and uh, bite ram, bite uh, registration. What I'm getting at is that if we do that and then print these try-ins, um, what I saw in the beginning, right, the very first week, <laughs> I found I, this. See, this is a way of eliminating bite rims in custom trays because if I build those try-ins from that reference denture data, right? I start there. I create that, and if that's not right, if it's not perfect, then all I have to do is take another impression in it, adjust occlusion, and take a bite, right? So my try-in ditchers become the best set of bite rims and custom trays you've ever had. It's got teeth. It's probably pretty close but it's much easier to then record the changes. And from those changes, the lab can go to the final. So back to the five appointments, where are we changing? Well, I think we're eliminating this thing. I really do. And I had two people in the lab, that's all they did. And, I, and I, none of us liked them, right? Nobody liked them and uh, they're hard to do. And if we get rid of them, so be it. So we call this a reference denture uh, workflow. And so I'll go through a case or two, give you an idea. All right, so existing dentures, if the bite's okay, then we just take a bite. Uh, always put a dot on the chin and nose and measure, right? Because when we take impression in the denture, I don't want to open the bite too much. So I want to get back to those two points as best I can. I don't need a real thick amount of impression material here. Now, I'm probably going to change what you're doing a little bit with your reline impressions and, and tell you that I would want you to put a bead of heavy bodied, uh, fast set uh, polyvinyl siloxane around the border, put that in the mouth, and do some border molding movements. I love what Eric Kakucha does. It's ooh, ee, ah tongue out, left and right with the tongue, close, swallow a couple of times. Those movements are gonna capture the muscle connections a whole lot better than just a static impression. So we do that with the border molding, heavy body polyvinyl first, then we put the wash in and go back in the mouth and do that again. All the while checking you know, our vertical to make sure we're not opening the bite. Once we're done, then this is what we have, right? We have an upper impression, a lower impression, and a bite registration. If we needed to open that bite, we'd get the Conmedia out or we'd get our own knowledge out and we would open it to what we wanted to open it with a piece of wax, a piece of putty and record that bite that way. And the scanner is going to pick that up as well. So we've got two impressions and a bite that can go to the lab and go in the scanner. Now, most patients don't want to give up their denture. So that's where the intraoral scanners really shine. So scanning a denture with an intraoral wand is the probably the easiest scan to accomplish of any scan. These scanners are fantastic at it. So um, but let's talk about this case. So lower denture, completely worn out, had to rebuild the heels a little bit with some compound, but then went through the heavy bodied border, light bodied wash. Uh, this patient was one of those patients who had had a set of dentures after these dentures, but wouldn't wear them because um, the occlusion in the back, she never got used to it, even after coming back 10 times. And so she went back to a set of 12 year old dentures, these, and, and wore those for three years and finally came back and said, look, I just, I, I gotta do something else. Well, what we learned in that process is that look, we don't open the bike when it doesn't need to be opened. If they're not comfortable open, we don't open them. And I know that goes against my, you know, in the heart of hearts, I, I wanna restore that occlusion, but look, if 60% of them are not gonna wear them because we open the bike, then I'm not gonna open the bike anymore. But scanning them is easy. And you see that I've got powder on this one, but that's because that's Impergum and it's shiny. Most polyvinyl siloxanes are not gonna be that reflective and I, and I only use powder if I have to have it. But I want you to notice one thing about this scan. I am not scanning the uh, palatal surface, the tongue surface. I only scan the intaglio, the borders and the buccal surface, right? There's a reason for that. Uh, number one, I don't like doing it because it takes too long and it eats up too much data and it slows me down. Number two, the lab software, if we're setting this case up to be a new denture, expects a scan that is not watertight. And if you scan the whole denture 360, you create a watertight scan. So again, intaglio, borders, and buccal surfaces. So, you know, here's the reference denture, right? We've taken those two impressions, we've taken the bite, we, we're, we're scanning the inside the impression, we're scanning the bite registration, and 
that's three scan files that go to the lab. Then we clean out the denture and give it back to Ms. Smith so she can go home and we can go build the dentures just from those three scans. The lab, when they bring those scans in, their software inverts those impressions into models in the right position. And now the lab guy has the data he needs to set the teeth. So what you see here are, of course, the models that were created from the digital impression scans. And the purple is the patient's existing denture and the white is my denture setup. So you can see it's a, it, it, it's a template. It's a paint by numbers. I just got to go in my molds and find a, a mold as close to what she was wearing or make the changes according to what the dentist tells me about length and position. And I can set it that way, but a clusal plane, uh, anterior posterior position, uh, over the ridge position is all, I'm going to use that reference picture as a guide. Now I get it. She tells me she didn't like it, but I, she didn't like it because it didn't stay in well. You know, she never said she didn't like it because it felt like the teeth stuck too far out. If she did, she would tell me that, right? And we would change that. But the reference dentures, for the most part, give us a great reference point of everything. And so it's an easy setup to do. So if you think about it this way, it's a win-win-win, right? The patient wins because she gets to keep her denture, right? The dentist and assistant win because it's an easy impression bite to take with those existing dentures. The lab guy wins because he's got the data he needs now to make a really good set of uh, try-in dentures. And that's what we do, right? We make the try-ins, we send them out, and then the dentist makes adjustments or draws or marks, whatever way you want to communicate back to the lab, the changes that you need. And again, I think I just eliminated the need to do these things because those printed try-ins become that for me if I need to do it at all. I, I will tell you that not many have to be uh, impressed again. Some do, but it you know depends on the impression. So this is a case where uh, we printed the try-in. Uh, it fit wonderfully, but there was some tooth movement that needed to be done, some buckle quarter. You saw that Dr. Wagner had drawn a little bit on the side that he wanted the buckle quarter out. And so all we're doing is scanning the changes, right? And that data can go in the lab software and the, the lab can merge that with the original file and go ahead and set the teeth in the new position and print to the final. And you know, again, that to that with just some computer work. What, what I've just described is the reference denture workflow. The reference denture workflow, if you want some follow-up, uh, there's a video that Dent Supply did, that's the cover screen, and I'll show you a QR code in a minute, but you can YouTube it as well, and just look up the term reference denture workflow. Um, but somebody always says, I wanna use my scanner in the mouth, I wanna use it in the mouth. I said, okay, um, I will do this. If you put the scanner in the mouth and scan the upper and lower ridge only, I don't need anything else, um, and send me the scans, and if we, together feel like we've captured 60 to 70% of the data, then what I will do with that data is I will digitally create base plates, right? These will be better base plates than traditional base plates because they're digitally created from the scan. And the 60 to 70% of the data that you got will make them fit better in those areas. But if you see those scans, all the data that I need to make a denture is certainly not there. But I can use that data to make these base plates, put some bite rims on them, send them back to the dentist. The dentist can use these base plates to take an impression wash in the upper and lower and then take the bite with the bite rim included and then scan those things like the reference denture. So that's one way you can kind of get in the digital world, um, some analog, some digital. <laughs> um, yeah, this QR code for the reference denture workflow video. Uh, if you want to go to YouTube later to maybe, because everything I just said is on that 30 minute video. All right. So, this question's already in somebody's mind, I know it, so let's answer it now. What if they don't have dentures, right? The 20%, 30%, 40% that come in that are fully edentulous, no dentures, and I'm not talking about immediates, I'm just talking about dentulous folks. Well, we gotta start in the analog world, right? So you gotta take impressions. So this is a case we recently did with uh, Dr. Wendy Clark at UNC, and uh, so Densply wanted to do some recording. So, you know, we got some good pictures in, uh, you know, so of this workflow so you could see it. So start with alginates or alginate substitute for the stone model, make some base plates. One thing that we do like to do though, when we're gonna do traditional workflow with a couple of base plates and a bite rim, is that we do that appointment in the same appointment, right? I don't, I, I can't imagine why I would ever wanna do uh, an impression appointment and a bite rim appointment separately, right? I, I think we can, do it better today and cut at least one or two days out. But I did mention that we can scan that soft tissue to make those bite rims. So here we are. And first appointment again, uh, alginate substitute, you know, good set of models, make some base plates, some bite rims, right? And then Dr. Wendy is going to take that heavy bodied uh, polyvinyl around the border and go in the mouth and do some border molding movements and capture that with that heavy body, right? And once that's done, uh, we sets up, we're going to put the wash in there, go back in the mouth and do it again. Right? So we've captured the border molding movements two times, but with uh, two phases of impression material. 
Then we're going to take the bite, right? So this is where Dr. Wendy has to, you know, get the knife out, the flame out, and start carboning, shaping that wax rim. And, you know, that appointment took about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. And that, that, I said, Dr. Wendy, that's why folks don't like to do it. It's just hard. And, you know, she loves doing it uh, and she's good at it, but it takes a lot of time. But at the end, we've got, you know, two impressions and a bite, right? And I can take that over to the lab scanner and scan it, or I can pick up a prime scan and I can scan it with the prime scan and send those three files over. Either way works, right? Because at the end, that's what I'm going to see on the computer screen. There are two models and a bite. And from that, I can design that denture, finish those two dentures, right? And in uh, Dr. Winnie's case, she wanted the monolithic try in So I exported the monolithics and then went over to the printer and printed out those monolithic dentures for try in So third appointment, right? Uh, try ins are going to go in. Dr. Wendy's going to do her analytics of function, movement, phonetics, right? Fox planes, vertical, right? Make sure everything's in place. And for the most part, it's good. The upper was pretty much spot on, but the lower, uh, she said it, I, I missed the impression a little bit on the, the right ridge. And so uh, it uh, kind of monkeyed with the bite a little bit. So obviously you see that she had to gr do some grinding. You see the marks on the upper. We did most of the, all the grinding on the lower and, and then took a, you know, I got to communicate that data back to me so I can make those changes. And so we just took new records, right? You take another impression wash in that lower, take a new bite to the adjusted uh, teeth. And at the end, that's what we have, right? Is uh, the try-ins that uh, I, we can then scan again with the prom scan or in the lab scanner. And so there's the lower with the new wash and the new bite. And there it is on my screen. And from there, it's just a matter of matching things up, right? So the gray that you see fading in and out, that is the original design. And the brown, the tan is um, where she ground it down to, right? So what I've got to do now is reset it, right? Into that new vertical. And it, it's, it takes a little bit of work, but it's actually pretty easy to do. And the great thing is that I have this data. So if, if you see the kind of modeling look, you see, I've already reset it. I got the cuss tips back, but I've got it set in that occlusal uh, bite that she took. And so I'm extremely satisfied. It didn't take me long to do that. And now I'm ready to print that final denture. So, you know, we go over to the printer, we take that file and you know, we print that base. Uh, these printers are printing this, this polymer resin in about two hours, right? So we have those denture bases done in two hours and then take them out, clean them up and assemble the teeth after printing the teeth. And it, it's fascinating to watch. And, I get excited about it every time I do it. So printed base, printed the teeth, uh, assembled, right? Right, assembled, the, again, the bonding resin. I don't know if it's sorcery, guys, but I can't get teeth out, so thrilled about that. We have a glaze now for our, our system, a few three total, we call it, that puts a wonderful glaze and seal on the teeth and base and, you know, cure it, we got a new curing unit, and, you know, it's ready to go back to Dr. Wendy. So we bring the patient in for appointment four, right? And it's amazing. This guy, this was his seventh, I think he told me, set of dentures he's had. And he said, oh my gosh, I can't tell you the difference these have. This is the best denture experience I've ever had, the fit. Uh, it's all good. He said, it's really cool to see the digital. Happy camper, um, happy patient. Very, very successful case. All right, I got to wrap it up, Donna. All right, immediates. I just want to tell you, um, Dr. Wendy says that she has not done an immediate case traditionally in two and a half years. And so much so that uh, she asked me to come in next year. We're gonna, they're changing the, the curriculum at UNC that they, they're gonna teach students in that second, third year that immediate dentures to be done digitally. And there's a big reason for that, right? If you can scan the upper and lower arch and scan the bite, then that's digitized, right? And the lab's going to do what it does to take the teeth off. We have something called a virtual extraction tool that extracts the teeth and cuts the model down. Right, so we have now the model to build the denture on, but what we also have are the extracted teeth. So as I'm setting the teeth, I have the extracted teeth, I can turn on and off to see where they need to go. That's data we've never had with the traditional stone workflow. So from that data, we can make the dentures, print the dentures, just like I described with the other thing. Copy denture, that's for a tool that's really cool that uh, you have available to you that 
if there's a patient that says, I want my denture just like my denture now, well, we can do that now. We can make it out of these new materials. Our software will actually separate the teeth from the base virtually and allow us to print both pieces and bond them together and result in a denture that's exactly like the old ratty denture that she's wearing. But of course, this patient said, I want them just like this, adamant about it, but I want them to fit better. Okay, we did an impression wash and I want them whiter. Of course you do. So, you know, we picked a lighter shade and, but we made an exact replica of her dentures. So great for getting backups. Just remember when you're scanning for copy dentures, you do have to scan 360. When you're scanning for reference denture, you're scanning just the impression and the outer surface. You don't need the other side, but copy dentures you do. Implants, of course, if I've got a resin that's three times stronger than acrylic, why not use it over my locators, right? Why not use it over my um, implants for all on four conversions? Being done every day with loose tone digital print. And Densply has this new thing, uh, this scan post, the IO uh, Flow S, where these scan posts are so accurate with the Prime Scan that a lab can order a superstructure and without a verification appointment. So that's where the technology has gone, guys, with the digital workflows of dentures. So, um, yep. So circle back around to real life, and uh, being a grandfather has uh, been a joy for me. That uh, QR code is my contact info. Um, of course, you could get to me through NDX, but uh, if anybody needs to reach out, my email and cell phone are there.